Welcome to module three of our training in stress management skills with biofeedback and mindfulness. In this module, we finally get to doing some biofeedback training. We've taken some time getting here because preparation is key. I think it's really important to approach biofeedback with the right mindset, or there's a danger that it just won't be effective for you, or even that you could end up feeling worse. And we're starting with EMG biofeedback, EMG being a measure of muscle tension. EMG is a good way into biofeedback because it's easy to work with. It's easy to feel the connection between the measurement and your subjective sense of your body. And you can get how it relates to stress and emotions. And it's also relatively easy to learn to relax muscle tension. Let's start by listing the objectives of this module. First, we're going to explore the connection between muscle tension and subjective experience in some depth. In so doing, I want to really show you why biofeedback is such a useful thing to do, and also what makes EMG a good biofeedback parameter. We'll cover that later in this video. Second, I'll show you how to set up and run an EMG biofeedback session, how to work with the software, how to set up the hardware. Of course, I'll be using the equipment and software that I use with my client, Rentals. Uh, if you have other hardware and software, this part of the course is not going to be directly relevant. Then, once you know how to run a biofeedback session, then we have the practical task of learning how to relax, how to fully release muscle tension. Of course, ultimately, you want to be able to apply what you've learned to solving the problems and issues that brought you to the course in the first place. So we'll be saying something about that. We'll take a closer look at breathing. As I said in the course introduction, breathing is a theme that runs right through the course. Optimal breathing is a key foundation for stress management, emotional balance and optimal performance. Of course, we use muscles in breathing. So our muscle tension skills will feed into breathing. They'll become an important component of the breathing skill set. To be honest, most people will start to see the real benefits when we get onto other aspects of breathing later in the course. But muscle tension skills are foundational, something we need to get right before we can move on to other breathing parameters. We'll finish by taking a look at how muscle tension biofeedback fits in with mindfulness practice. It's fair to say that when you're first learning biofeedback, it's rather different from mindfulness practice. But as you develop more familiarity, then the practice can start to become more like mindfulness practice. This presentation is really just an introduction and orientation for working with biofeedback, recapping and expanding on what I said back in the course introduction. In module one, we worked on your personal goals for the course, and we reframed the goals in terms of developing skills. And biofeedback is a tool for developing these skills, nothing more. In itself, it's not a treatment or a therapy, it's just a tool that you can work with. It's a vehicle for your learning. And I've been speaking in terms of mind-body skills or the skills of self-regulation, how to guide and influence your body's physiological state. So the foundation is the mind-body connection, the simple idea that how you think, feel, act, and pay attention is reflected in what your body is doing and what your body is capable of doing. If we think of the project in terms of a problem and a solution, then we're saying that the problem state is associated with a certain physiology. Physiology just means the processes going on in the body and the regulation or control of those processes so that the body keeps running within healthy bounds. So for example, if the problem is anxiety, then we're saying that there's a physiology for anxiety or a state of body functioning that underpins anxiety or at least makes anxiety more likely to arise. And the solution state also has a physiology that is somehow different from the problem state. If we know what the difference is or what changes in the physiology as you move from problem state to solution state, then we have a strategy for change, which is to learn to guide the body into the more favorable physiology associated with the solution. If we can make that physiological shift, then at least we can make the solution state much more accessible. So this slide is just borrowed from the module on mindfulness, where I listed a few problem states and a few positive qualities or resources. 
So if the solution is calm, clear focus, then we need to know what is the physiology for calm, clear focus, the body state that will make it easy for us to be calm, clear and focused. Then we want to learn how to embody that state. We need to learn to make the transition. And as you might have guessed by now, I'm suggesting that broadly speaking, tight, tense muscles are one aspect of the problem physiology, while soft, loose muscles are more favorable to the solution states. I'll say more on this in a minute. So how does biofeedback work? Well, we measure some aspect of physiology that changes between problem and solution, like muscle tension. You feed the measurement back in real time, for example, as a graph on the computer screen that goes up and down right as your body changes. If it's muscle tension, the graph will go up as you tighten up and then drop down when you relax. Muscle tension or EMG is just one possible biofeedback parameter. Of course, there are others and we'll cover some of them in later modules of the course. So as a trainee, you're watching this feedback or this graph you're watching it change and you start to feel that it's changing in conjunction with your subjective sense of your body. And this confluence of external feedback and internal or subjective experience, this is the basis for learning. In the first place, it means developing your sensitivity. So with something like muscle tension, you can be aware of it, but you're not necessarily fully aware of it. You can miss the fine details of it. And if you're not really aware of it, you can't really control it, at least not consciously. So increasing your self-awareness or sensitivity is the basis for learning to control or influence your physiology. In the course introduction, I listed three ways in which biofeedback creates lasting change in the long term. Firstly, it offers insight into how your mind works or understanding of the mind-body connection. So this means getting insight into how your mind actually creates the problems that you want to solve. Seeing it means you can do something about it. Secondly, it's the basis for skills development. To solve your problem, you need to know what to do, but also how to do it. It takes time and practice to develop such skills. But once you've done the work, then you have those skills available as useful resources when the circumstances call for them. Thirdly, biofeedback training is a kind of fitness training. It's like gym training for the brain and nervous system. With regular practice, you're building your fitness, which means that you're better able to respond to challenges as they arise. If you're physically fit and you find you're in danger of, say, missing a bus or a train, then you can run and catch it. Nervous system fitness means that you can cope with the challenges of emotional and social stress when it arises, so it confers a kind of stress resilience. Returning to muscle tension, you might be able to get a sense that it fits the first two of these routes to change, but actually not really the third. Of course, there are other parameters that are much better suited to the fitness model, so different parameters have their own strengths and weaknesses. So let's look at what makes a good biofeedback parameter. Well, the most obvious thing is that it's got to change between problem state and the solution state. And muscle tension fits the bill here. You can probably agree, based on your own experience, that we tend to be tight when stressed and loose when relaxed. Another parameter that fits the criterion here is heart rate. The heart tends to pound and race under stress, at least acute stress, and then slow down again as we calm down. But the parameter also needs to be easily felt subjectively. What you're doing with biofeedback training is that the external feedback helps you to tune in to your own internal feedback so that ultimately you don't really need the external feedback anymore. And you can probably see that muscle tension meets this criterion, while heart rate isn't so good because it's hard to discern the subtle variations in heart rate associated with everyday emotions. Lastly, you want a parameter that you can learn to influence. Again, muscle tension fits the bill because you already have some influence over it. It's easy to let go of high tension or at least partially let go of it. What you're going to be doing here is to learn fine control of what you can already do to some extent. But heart rate, well, it's much harder to learn to consciously control it. For most people, that wouldn't be a very useful thing to try. Heart rate itself isn't used as a biofeedback parameter, though as we'll see in module 5, the pattern of change in heart rate or heart rate variability is used. 
So let's come back to the muscle tension measurement. What we measure is called EMG or electromyography. It's an electrical correlate of muscle tension. Physically speaking, it's a voltage. What we're actually measuring is the strength of the signal firing in the nerves that control the muscle. The stronger this signal is, the more the muscle fibers tighten up. Let's just spell out the nature of the mind-body connection here. I've already talked about it to some extent, but the basic pattern is that if we send some kind of threat, then we tighten up. For example, the fists might clench and the shoulders go up. It's a kind of defensive response, as though we're bracing against a coming blow. So for example, when you're in the dentist's chair being poked and prodded and drilled, it's natural to tighten up. I remember when I first became aware of this, quite a long time ago now, when I realised that I had my feet sticking right up in the air. The interesting thing here is that while we can deliberately and consciously choose to tighten up, to clench our fists and pull up our shoulders, we can also do it quite automatically, involuntarily, in response to emotional stimuli. In the dentist's chair, it's understandable because we fear the physical pain. But we also do it when there's no physical threat, just an emotional threat. For example, suppose a week before you're due for a filling, the thought of it pops into your head. Well, chances are you'll tighten up then and there, even if it's just a little, and even if you don't clearly feel it or notice it. Or imagine yourself waiting to take an exam, or sitting in your performance review meeting with your boss, or wondering if you're going to fluff your golf shot. The point is, there's a physical response as though we're bracing against a threat, even when there's nothing physical to brace against. The threat is merely psychological. The same thing can happen with bad memories. Say you had a fallout with somebody, or you gave a presentation and it was a disaster. Then the memory of it can keep intruding into your mind, bringing with it the same flood of emotions. When that happens, we'll tend to tighten up, as though bracing against painful emotions. Memories can make us wince, which is of course a tightening up of the face. I think this kind of physical change is key to what makes something feel bad. So the thought of next week's dental appointment or next week's performance review meeting can make you feel bad. I think you have to have the physical response for it to actually feel bad, otherwise it's just another thought. Remember in module one I defined feeling as the perception of a bodily response. The thought that you're going on holiday next week, well, that doesn't feel bad because it provokes a quite a different physical response. And the thought that you're going for a haircut next week, well, that might not feel like anything much at all if it doesn't trigger a body response. So the idea is if you can somehow block the physical response, then you can change the feeling too. I think whenever we have an experience that we don't want or we don't like, whether it's a worry or an intrusive bad memory, we're likely to have at least some physical tightening up, as though we could hold off the experience or keep it away from us. I call this resistance or inner resistance, and I think it's extremely common and I think it's an important part of how the mind creates our problems, especially anxiety. Muscle tightening is also likely to be a part of anger and irritation. We tighten up not to hold something off, but in preparation for lashing out against it. Even if we never do lash out. Even if the trigger is just a thought. Indeed, you've probably heard of the fight or flight response. That's really what we're talking about here. An aspect of the fight or flight response, but only one aspect, mind, is muscle tightening. So if feeling threatened leads to muscle tightening, the opposite is also true. Loosening, letting go of muscles, goes with feeling safe. I think having an emotional sense of safety or security is not simply the absence of threat, it's a positive emotional state in its own right. And that's something we all need as a resource. We all need to be able to tap into that resource and being able to let go of muscle tension is a useful component of that. I think it'll be useful to go into the mental dynamics of this in a bit more depth. Back in module one, we talked about the mutually conditioning relationship between thoughts and feelings, feelings being body responses. So for example, the thought, I'm going to fail this exam, will trigger an anxious feeling. On the other side, the more nervous you feel before the exam, the more likely thoughts about failing it will pop into your head, or the more likely you are to believe them. 
I think there's something really fundamental going on here, which is that the mind is acting like a sort of experiential simulator. When we have a decision or choice to make, what happens is we imagine the consequences or we imagine how the consequences would feel. This is quite automatic and immediate, perhaps very, very subtle. If I ask you, would you like a cup of coffee? You're able to answer because you imagine how it will feel to have that coffee. It might feel good or bad. If good, you'll say yes. If bad, you'll say no. This process helps you make the decision. This happens for pretty much any thought or idea that enters your head. It's like an automatic part of your mind goes, what would that feel like? Or what would it feel like if that were to happen? Or what would it feel like if that were true? And then the mind actually creates a feeling that answers the question. So the thought triggers a bodily change, and then we perceive that change as a feeling. And that's happening in the here and now. You don't have to wait. Okay, it'll be a weaker version of the feeling, but it's still a real physical response and may even be measurable. So if you think to yourself, I'm going to fail the exam, this part of the mind asks how that will feel, and it's going to feel bad. You're likely to have some resistance, not wanting that feeling, so you tighten up. This even happens empathetically, again quite automatically. If I tell you I failed my exam, then you'll have a bad feeling for me, as you mentally put yourself in my place. It might be subtle and momentary, but it goes on. That's how you know to offer me your commiserations. It happens when you're watching films and TV dramas, and when you're reading a novel as you imaginatively empathise with the characters. If it didn't happen, then it'd be a pretty boring film or a book. Again, just to repeat my main point, no body response triggered means no feeling. Returning to muscle tension, I guess for most people it'll be easy to accept the idea that we tense up when stressed or threatened, because it's clear and obvious, at least when the stress is strong and overt. But for some people, because of their personal temperament, they're not really tuned into what their body is doing. The body doesn't really impinge much on their awareness because they might be off in the world of thinking rather than feeling. These people might not experience emotions very strongly or clearly. They might find it difficult to know or say how they feel. Even if this isn't you, you probably know people like this. The emotions can still be there, they're just experienced in a different way. For example, if you're angry, you might spend your time thinking about how you've been wronged and not being able to focus on your work or whatever. So muscle tension changes can happen outside awareness, and all the more so when the trigger is minor or subtle. The tightening response can be correspondingly subtle and easy to miss. Suppose you're worried about losing your job because your employer is having to make cuts or something like that, or you're worried about not being able to pay your mortgage. These are thoughts that can nag away at us, maybe several times a day or even several times an hour. For ongoing worries, the defensive response, the tightening, can become stuck, can become a habit. And this can be a problem. It's much harder to be aware of a steady state as opposed to a change. So often, muscle tension associated with stress is like the fridge in the kitchen. It's humming away in the background, and you think it's all quiet until it switches itself off. And only then do you notice it. So all this is really about why it's useful to work with muscle tension. It's possible to refine your sensitivity or expand your self-awareness so that you have more control over this subtle kind of tension. Let's bring it back to our core theme of breathing. We've been talking about how emotional stimuli can trigger bodily change, and one part of this is that they affect breathing. So how we're breathing in some way embodies our emotions. To get an idea of this, think of gasping. <gasps> Physically a sharp intake of breath followed by holding. Typically it's triggered by a shock or something fearful. Or another example is sighing. This is forced or drawn out exhalation. And you can sigh because you're fed up or bored or exasperated, like or you can sigh with relief or with pleasure. And likewise, the stress response affects how we breathe. 
Later in the module, we'll look at specific breathing patterns associated with stress. Stressed breathing, or defensive breathing, can become stuck, habitual, and un unconscious. And this can be key to the persistence of problems. So in all these examples, we're using the breathing muscles in different ways. Changing breathing involves changing how we use breathing muscles. And as we'll see, a significant part of optimal breathing is being able to fully release the breath or fully release the breathing muscles. But before we get on to breathing, the first goal is to learn to release muscle tension. And even before that is mindset. Earlier, I stressed the importance of coming to biofeedback with the right mindset. We spent quite a lot of time in the earlier modules just exploring what that mindset is. In module one, we looked at the stress mindset, which is your view of what stress means. Do you see it as a threat or as a challenge? Do you believe that stress is harmful and therefore to be avoided, or that the stress response is your body's rising to a challenge, giving you more energy and boosting your performance? And we saw the importance of your stress mindset because positive or negative, it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Stress mindset is important when it comes to biofeedback. If you're seeing biofeedback as a way of avoiding stress or as a way of inoculating yourself against anxiety, then I don't think it's going to work for you. Rather, biofeedback is a tool for working with stress, for keeping yourself in the zone of good stress, where stress is working for you and you're maintaining your positive stress mindset. And it's also a tool for strengthening your recovery from stress, so building resilience. Then we talked about the quicksand trap, which means situations where you actually make things worse by trying too hard in some sense. And the quicksand trap is a real danger in biofeedback practice. In muscle tension biofeedback, that would mean that you try hard to relax and the graph actually goes up, not down. It does happen all too easily. In module two, we talked about the mindfulness mindset as being in some way the antidote of the quicksand dynamic. It's this attitude of holding a purpose, but without hanging anything on actually achieving it, as though you were playing a game. In the earlier modules, I introduced a couple of models as reframes or new ways of seeing the challenge. The dual intelligence model is about seeing two different sides of the mind. This other part that I'm calling body intelligence is where the resources that you need truly lie. And quicksand happens when the thinking part tries to do something that's best left to the body. So when it comes to muscle tension, it's the body intelligence that knows how to relax. I want you to remember that if you find it difficult to let go when you first try the biofeedback. Your body already knows how. It's not about trying harder. It's not about figuring it out or problem solving. It's about how to allow the body to do it for you. The new question is, how do we engage the body intelligence if not by willpower? I'll say more about that in part three. And I want to return to the point that I made earlier about feeling a sense of safety. Before you can let go, you have to feel it's safe to do so. If you don't feel safe, right down at this deep level, if the body doesn't feel safe, then it's going to be very difficult to let go. And even if it's possible, it's not going to feel good. Again, this is a point that I'll return to later. Another model is the human performance curve. The key idea that this gets across is that it's a matter of balanced application. Here's where we want to be, peak performance. And we often get stuck over here, heading downhill because we're trying too hard. That's the quicksand trap again there. What we need is two complementary faculties. First, the effort and the ability to rouse up our energy. And this takes us to the right. It's very important to have that capacity, but it's not enough on its own because at times we need to come back this way. This is relaxing, reducing arousal, letting go or accepting. Our culture teaches us to be pretty good at this one, but not so much this one moving back to the left. Learning to relax muscle tension is an aspect of this leftward faculty. The expression letting go is interesting because we can use it literally or physically, but more often than not, we use it in a psychological sense. So we speak of letting go of anger or letting go of resentment 
or letting go of fear. But this is not merely metaphorical. Hopefully by now you're starting to see that letting go of resentment has a physical component, which is letting go of muscle tension. If you can't release muscle tension, it's going to be so much harder to let go of an emotion. For example, to let go of a grudge or to forgive other people or even yourself. That's because to really feel an emotion in the first place, you have to embody it, typically as tension or in part as tension. Let's just finish up by reviewing what's coming up next in this module. In part two, I'll show you how to run an EMG biofeedback session in terms of hardware and software. Then part three will be more teaching on how to actually let go, how to relax muscles. Of course, we're very much practically focused at this point, so I'll be suggesting plenty of biofeedback practice. In part four, I'll say more about applying your skills in muscle relaxation to your problem contexts. Then in part five, we'll look at breathing in more detail and how EMG biofeedback fits with breathing training. In part six, we'll be shifting to a different placement for EMG sensors, namely to the forehead. This placement picks up a different set of muscles, and so it offers us a new window on the mind-body relationship. Finally, we'll look at how EMG biofeedback can be combined with mindfulness practice. A little exercise might be useful at this point, and this one is just really a thought exercise as much as anything. You can go back to your problem descriptions from module one, and especially exercise 1.1.3. So reread that, and see if you can discern that muscle tension is part of the problem. And if so, in what part of the body? You can also have a look at your graded contexts that we did in exercise 1.1.5.